Let's pray together. God, it is true that all our lives you've been faithful and good to us, even when we were unfaithful, and even when we were ignoring you, and you're good to us now, and you will be good to us forever. We thank you that your goodness is on display this week of all weeks in the love and mercy and grace of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray and worship in his name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to say again, welcome to those of you that are here for the first time. If you're a guest or visitor with us and those that are joining us online, we're glad you're with us on this Palm Sunday. Uh, We'd love to get to know you if you're new and you're here in person. Obviously, right after the service, there'll be something called a meet and greet. We'll just stand back there in the lobby. We'd love to get to know you by face. Feel free to stop by the kiosk and say hello, meet some of our staff. And if you're online, you can certainly click the link and share some information with us. We'd love to get to know you virtually as well. This is Communion Sunday, so if you came in and you didn't get one of these cups with communion elements in it, put your hand up. The ushers will come and make sure you have that. We'll be taking communion at the end of the service today. Uh, Today is Palm Sunday. And I was thinking about this reality, Joe, Pastor Joe mentioned last night, the Saturday night service, that Holy Week, which begins today, uh, is bookended by celebration. Historically, Jesus is celebrated as the triumphal king coming into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And then on Easter Sunday, we celebrate him as the risen king. And in between, we remember his crucifixion, his death and his suffering for us. As, uh, as you know, if you've been around, it's a significant week in the life of our church, uh, and one of the ways we commemorate this week is with a Monday Thursday commu- Holy Week communion service. So here in this campus on this coming Thursday, it's not Monday Thursday. People get confused by that. It's Monday. That comes from a Latin word where we get our English word mandatum, meaning mandate. It's the command Jesus gave us to remember him through bread and cup at the communion table. We'll do that together as a church family. These three services on Thursday, the whole service is about the table of the Lord. It's a great chance for you to come and worship and celebrate and remember together as a church family. Make plans to attend. We'll see you on Thursday. And then, of course, Easter Sunday. Resurrection Sunday. We have baptisms at all of our campuses, and perhaps you're here and you've been thinking about last week, uh, John Dixon, who will be preaching to us again in just a few moments, talked to us about taking a next step. And maybe this is your step. Maybe Easter 2023, baptism is your step. And if that's the case, we'd love to help you with that. Uh, There's information on the website, call the church office, and we'd love to help you take that step to honor God with the faithfulness Uh, your faithful step of baptism as he's been so faithful to you and his son, Jesus. All this information is available to you on our website. Uh, You can check in with that. One other thing that's coming up later this week is our uh, student missions uh, uh, celebration. Uh, This is a great event for the whole family. Our students go and serve all over the country and world in the summer. We celebrate, tell stories. There's a silent auction as well as live auction items. Whether you have kids going or not, you can come hear amazing stories, pray for these kids, and be a part of the auction. It's a great church family event later coming up in this month. Um, Now, again, all this is available for you online. And to those of you who are regularly generous to our mission here, I want to say thank you. We praise God for you and are grateful for your generosity. Uh, Now, in order to prepare us for the message this morning, we're going to stand for the reading of God's Word. Let's stand together. Now, i got to teach you something, because not all of us know this. I'm going to read the Word of God to you, and then at the end, I'm going to say, this is the Word of the Lord. And you're going to say, not cool or awesome, you're going to say, thanks be to God. All right, you ready? Here we go. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of the first day of the week, When the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Again, it's always good to be back here. Uh, we call this uh, Holy Week, as, as you've just heard. Uh, but actually, if you know the accounts of the first Holy Week, it's a really weird mix of faith and doubt. So the Palm Sunday, when Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey, the, seems like the whole city has come out in faith and confidence and declaring him to be the king. But of course, by the end of the week, the skepticism has risen to such a height that they arrest him and kill him. Faith and doubt in the same week. And then of course, you might say, oh yeah, but Sunday it's all cool, right? Because Jesus is raised to life and they all have faith in him. Yeah, sort of, but then there's doubting Thomas who says, I won't believe. So it's a really strange mix of faith and skepticism. And I point that out because we in our neck of the woods seem to be in a period where faith is dwindling and skepticism is rising. Has that been anyone else's perception? Certainly in my old homeland of Australia and my new homeland of America, (laughs) skepticism is on the rise. In Australia in 2021, it was reported by the government that now Christians are a minority in the country for the first time since our founding in 1788. In 10 years, it dropped from 61% of people thinking they were some kind of Christian down to 44% of the population. Now, I don't think there was ever 61% of Australians who thought they were Christians. Um, It's probably half that, and it's maybe even half the 44% now, but something significant is going on. There's this loss of attachment to the idea of Christianity. And you know what? America is just 10 years behind Australia. I know you're 30 years ahead in everything else, but on this, you're 10 years behind. In 2011, 78% of Americans said they were Christian in some way. We may quibble about what that exactly meant, but the drop is dramatic, down to 63% as of 2021. On that trajectory, 10 years from now, probably less, you'll be in the mid-40s, people claiming to be Christian. Again, we quibble about what that actually means, but something dramatic is happening, even in my new homeland. And the media is already warming up the headlines and speaking of a post-Christian America. Washington Post speaking about a Christian minority in the country. Uh, The uh, National Review, a, a more conservative Uh, paper talking about can America survive as a post-Christian nation. Even Christianity Today is speaking of a post-Christian America. The interesting thing, whenever I read these articles about the rise of skepticism and doubt in this country, they give the impression that these are new things, That, that skepticism is brand new. You know, as if ancient people believed any old crazy thing, But as we've advanced and become more educated, we doubt. We are the honorable doubters. We are just flattering ourselves. Because you only have to read some ancient literature. I mean, a little bit of Plato, a little bit of Aristotle, a little bit of Cicero or Augustine, and you'll realize that ancient people were excellent doubters. And our narrative... This story of Thomas is like the original doubting story. We have the expression, a doubting Thomas, from this Thomas, who says, unless I see the nail marks 
in his hands, I will not believe. Man, that would give a modern person a run for their money. See, his friends and colleagues have all had a resurrection appearance from Jesus. Thomas hasn't and remains skeptical. And I want to look at those appearances and Thomas's skepticism, faith and doubt, and then I want to land where this passage lands and what that means for life. The appearance is clear. Jeff just read it to us. It's on the first day of the week, meaning Sunday. Sunday was the first day of the week in antiquity. Uh, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. And he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. There's this commission. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, just a quick sidebar, because you may look at that last bit and think, what on earth is that about? I thought God was the, the one who forgave sins. And here he's saying these apostles are the ones. So what's going on here? I think it just means that these eyewitness apostles are the only ones authorized by Jesus to explain how sins are forgiven. Because they are the only ones authorized by Jesus, commissioned by him to tell the story of his life and teaching and death and resurrection. And if you think about it, we have no access to what Jesus said and did that isn't from an apostle. So I think that's what it means. You alone can explain how people's sins are forgiven. And in fact, um, John, one of the eyewitnesses who left us this particular account that we're looking at, will explain that way in the very last line of the passage. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. My, my point is that Thomas's friends and colleagues have all seen Jesus before he did. And it's worth repeating what I said last week. I mean, especially if you weren't here, it won't be repeating. Historians who are not Christians or who are agnostic about Christianity, take the resurrection appearances very seriously. Uh, last week, I cited the non-Christian Jewish scholar, Pincus Lapid, who said in a purely logical analysis, the resurrection of Jesus is the lesser of two evils. It's not like he's super keen on the idea. He thinks it's the lesser of two evils for all those who seek a rational explanation of the worldwide consequences of that Easter faith. And last week I also cited Ed Sanders of Duke University, one of the leading scholars of the last 30 years and an agnostic. He says that Jesus' followers and later Paul had resurrection experiences is in my judgment a fact. What the reality was that gave rise to the experiences, I do not know. Now if you weren't here last week and you're interested in what are the actual historical reasons scholars like these take the resurrection seriously, go back and have a listen uh, uh, to the message. I'm sure it was uh, recorded somewhere. But my point is, Thomas hadn't had this resurrection experience. And he's not just agnostic. He's not just saying that my friends had resurrection experiences is a fact. What explains those experiences, I do not know. No, what does Thomas say? Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, what graphic language, I will not believe. Ooh, mere pistuso. Literally, not ever shall I believe. He's not agnostic. He's dogmatically skeptical. He has made a decision not to trust the testimony of his closest friends and colleagues when they said, we have seen him. 
He has determined to doubt that and only believe what he can see and touch. Isn't that what he's saying? Unless I see and touch, I will not ever believe. He sounds very modern to me. You know, I'll believe it when I see it. I mean, it's a classic modern thing, but Thomas said it first. And Jesus has something to say about this so-called modern ancient approach of only believing what you can see and touch. Because when Jesus does appear to Thomas, Jesus says a very interesting thing. A week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. I, I, I imagine Thomas at that point just going, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. No, Lord, it's okay. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let's think about those final words for a moment because they are very frequently misunderstood as if Jesus were saying, shame on you, Thomas, for needing a reason to believe. Shame on you for using your brain. Shame on you for not just having blind faith where you jump off a cliff for no reason. That's how this passage is sometimes interpreted by the skeptical amongst us. It's how faith is sometimes presented in the modern world. In fact, it's exactly how the world's most famous atheist describes faith. Richard Dawkins says, a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. I mean, you just got to stop there and go, that's very cool writing. I mean, it annoys me, but it's such good writing. Faith, being belief that isn't based on evidence, is the principal vice of any religion. That's how loads of people think of it. And they think that's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who don't see and believe. It's blind faith. But actually, Richard Dawkins got into trouble with this in a debate in 2009 with the famed professor of mathematics from Oxford University, John Lennox. And if you've ever seen this debate, it is quite cool. Because Richard Dawkins has this, you know, typical faith is the opposite of evidence thing. And look what, look what happens. Dawkins, we only use the word faith when we don't have evidence. Lennox. Do you have faith in your wife, Richard? Dawkins, of course I have faith in my wife. Lennox, is that faith based on evidence? Dawkins, lots of evidence. And as soon as the words leave his mouth, he realizes what he's just done. <laughs> and the crowd erupts in laughter. Of course, faith is not the opposite of evidence. Faith and evidence often go hand in hand. In fact, did you know, it's one of the Oxford English Dictionary definitions of faith. This is definition 7b, which is a really good one for understanding, I think, the Christian idea of faith. Oxford English Dictionary definition of faith 7b is belief based on evidence, testimony, or authority. And it's this definition that lies in the background of what Jesus says to Thomas. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus is not making a distinction between believing with evidence and believing without evidence. He's making a distinction between Believing on the basis of personally observing something and believing on the basis of good testimony. Yeah? 
believing on the basis of seeing with your own eyes and believing on the basis of good testimony. The fact is, good testimony is a perfectly reasonable basis for belief, if it's good testimony. In fact, you can't do without it. Just run a thought experiment with me for a second. Imagine we decided today only to believe what we see and touch and always doubt what comes to us by good testimony. Yeah, you, you get home and your wife says, uh, can you help prepare the lunch? Why? Oh, because, uh, you know, we've got friends coming over. They're, they're coming over. Oh, I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> yeah, just try that. Try that. If you, if you decide only to believe what you see and touch and not believe good testimony, you're going to hardly know anything at all. Think of courts of law. Most legal judgments are made on the basis of testimony. I know you might see, you know, say, oh, but I've seen CSI and SVU and, and they're using forensics. Yeah, like one in a hundred cases might in the end depend on forensics. Testimony is actually how most legal judgments are made. Or think about history. Think of all the things you know about American history. How many of them do you know by your own sight and touch? Like, I'm going to go, none. <laughs> you, you believe what your history teacher told you. You might say, but I read those, you know, Revolutionary War letters for myself. Yeah, but you're still just believing testimony at that point. History is based on testimony, principally. Let's go even further. What about science? I put it to you, unless you're actually a practicing scientist, you know, unless your day job is looking down the microscope or looking out the telescope, even for you, right? 99% of what you know about science, you know only by testimony. Because you believed a scientist, a textbook, your science teacher. <laughs> the fact is, most of what we know about law and history and science and politics and art and the daily news we know through testimony. And for the three or four nerds in the building, if you want to explore this in great philosophical detail, I cannot recommend highly enough this book, Testimony of Philosophical Study. It's like the premier nerdy, nerdy book on the importance of testimony for knowing anything. But my point is that Christ's resurrection is an historical event. And by definition, historical events, once they've happened, aren't visible. And touchable. You only know history through testimony. Sure, if the testimony is flimsy, you, you are well within your rights to reject it. But if the testimony is good, early, widespread, sincere, and credible, it is reasonable to trust testimony. What isn't reasonable is to decide only to believe what you can see and touch. That's a dogma. And it's an intellectual mistake. Blessed are those who know that a historical event is known to us not through sight and touch, but through the normal means of knowing history, good testimony. Now, I know that all sounds very philosophical, but actually, the, the passage begins to end on personal things. So, of course, Thomas does get to see and touch Jesus, okay, because he, he, he was there at the time, and, and it's a, just a grace of Christ, that, that Christ appears to him and lets him do what he wanted to do. And Thomas's response is personal and dramatic. 
Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. A moment ago, he had said, ooh, meh, pistuso, not ever shall I believe. And now his words are just as dramatic. Kuriosmu, theosmu, my Lord, my God. This is personal. Not just Lord, God, my My Lord, my God. I love the reference to this passage in C.S. Lewis. Now, I know C.S. Lewis has been referenced once or twice in this church. <laughs> For those who, who don't know, Lewis, of course, was an atheist academic at Oxford University, quite vitriolic about Christianity, before coming to the same realization as Thomas. And I don't know how many times this particular quotation has been read out in this church, but it has to be read out when you're reflecting on this passage. Lewis, in his famous Mere Christianity book, said, a man who is merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of, with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Kurios, Theos, Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. The resurrection is a personal challenge, not just an intellectual one. It involves acknowledging not just an historical event, but an event with significance for me. It, it doesn't even just involve recognizing the status of Jesus as Lord and God. It involves the declaration, my Lord, my God. That's when you find forgiveness and life. Which brings us to the Apostle John's closing statement, the one I hinted at earlier. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. This is John the Apostle closing this scene, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Here is where John, the authorized eyewitness, fulfills the commission Jesus gave him moments earlier in the passage. This is where John explains the way of life, the way of forgiveness. This is how it works. And I find it remarkable that all of the apostles didn't add stuff. If Jesus had entrusted them, your explanation of forgiveness of sins and eternal life is the way. Jesus said to them, whatever you say goes. They didn't then say, Oh, you need to do these 15 rituals in order to be Christian. Oh, by the way, you need to say prayers to us apostles as intermediaries. If they were able to make it up, they could have made it up that made them look good. Instead, they didn't. All of them, you check them out. All of them said it's as simple as believing, trusting Jesus Christ. The simplicity and purity of what they passed on is, I think, remarkable. And if you read the whole of John's gospel, his biography of Jesus, it's very clear that what he's saying is Christ lived the perfect life none of us could live. 
And then he gave that perfect life on the cross as our substitute for people who have failed to love God and neighbor. He bore into himself our wrongdoing, our judgment. And then he rose again to breathe life, eternal life. And all of that is captured in this pure closing sentence. By believing, you may have life in his name. One of the great privileges of my ministry when I used to be a pastor was meeting this man. James Garber was a judge of the New South Wales court. And he turned up at my church one morning at the early service, sort of quite small service, quite traditional service. He, he sort of stuck out. He was sitting at the back. I was leading the service. I noticed him. And as soon as the service finished, I went up to him and introduced myself. He explained that he was brand new to church and that he had just received a terrible cancer diagnosis. And he started to say to me, I, I hope you're not cynical about that. Man gets bad cancer diagnosis, turns up at church. I said, James, I'm the last person to be cynical about that. But he explained, it just dawned on him, if he is going to die, only two things matter to him. His family, and if God exists, God. And so began wonderful afternoon cups of tea that I would go and have with James. He lived not 200 metres from church. And I'd go over, we'd sit down, and at first it was all just intellectual. He just wanted to know the intellectual basis of Christianity. And several se cup of tea sessions were just that. He, he, he had a, a spacious, capacious mind. And he wanted to know everything. And at one point he said to me, ah, it's interesting how similar your academic discipline is to mine. History and law. He, he said, so much of my life sitting on the bench is weighing testimony. He's listening to people and making judgments. And, and he, used to, he described to me the way that judges make live commentary on the testimony and weighting it actually giving it a weight as they hear it. He says, I have made massive decisions for other people based on testimony. And he said, that's what history is like, isn't it? I said, you bet. They're basically the same discipline. I'll never forget when one of these cup of tea sessions, he said to me, I've been reading the Gospels over and over and over, and I've been focusing on their resurrection accounts, and I think they are good testimony, he said. I said, I agree. <laughs> There's no way these are made up. They were his words. I've been judging testimony all my professional career. There's no way this was made up. And of course, at that point, it began to dawn on him, this, is, this can't just be an intellectual exercise. And James started to ask the meaning of this. If Jesus rose again, what does it mean? Especially in light of his cancer diagnosis. And, and I'm overjoyed to tell you that James came to a profound trust in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Now, I, I don't wanna sort of exaggerate because James still had doubts about all sorts of other topics. There were all sorts of things in Christianity he wasn't sure about. <laughs> But he decided that if he doesn't have super long to live, he just should focus in on the really big ticket item. Did Jesus live the life he could never live, he, James, could never live, and then give his life, Jesus' life, on the cross for us, and did he rise again? And if that's true, I want to trust it. James faced death with beautiful confidence in that core Christian 
report. I visited James um, just two or three days before he died. He was in hospital. He was in a morphine stupor. I'm sure many of you have seen this. And I walked into the room. He was completely out of it. But I, I, I went up to his bed and I said, James, it's John. Would you like me to pray with you? And he shot his hand up through the sheets to grab my hand. And I prayed with him. Probably a very inadequate prayer. But by the time I said, Amen, he had fallen back to sleep in that morphine stupor. And two or three days later, I got the phone call that James had died. And I would say, more alive than anyone in the room. The family asked me to lead the funeral. Uh, such a privilege. Sydney's legal fraternity turned out to my little church. We had senior lawyers, you know, it, it, was, it was just a legal fest. And, and because James was such a prominent person, they insisted on five eulogies. Now, Jeff will tell you, five, dear friends, is too many. Okay, just a tip. Anyway, so I sat there and te uh, eulogy after eulogy would, would just praise James's judgment, legal judgment. It was all about what impeccable judgment he had. This was a phrase they kept on using, impeccable judgment. When you knew James came down with a ruling, you, you just knew it, it was a measured, weighty ruling. And of course, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, well, I'm gonna have to change my sermon now. And I got up. And of course, I said, you have all been telling me what impeccable judgment he had. Let me tell you what his final judgment was about Jesus Christ. And I explained that James had analyzed the sources of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and had come to think there's no way they're made up, that they are good testimony. He weighed it and came to believe in Jesus Christ and he faced death with a confidence that was radically different because he believed in the risen one. So, I say to you, what Jesus said, actually for your benefit, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Will you believe? Trust. I don't just mean trust that an event took place at the first Easter. I don't even mean that you think Jesus is Lord and God. I mean, my Lord, my God, will you personally trust him? with your forgiveness, with your eternal life. Because when you trust, you have life in his name. Please believe. So Lord, will you please help each one of us wherever we are in our journey maybe of doubt, maybe of faith. Will you please enable each one of us to look to Jesus Christ, his perfect life, his death on our behalf and his glorious resurrection. Help us, Lord, each one to say in our hearts, my Lord, my God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. 
We're going to close our service by observing the Lord's Supper. But before we do, I just want to say a couple of words about this. Some of you may be new to Chapel Street Church, maybe new to church in, entirely. We say every time that we take communion together, you don't need to be a member here or even a regular attender here to come to the Lord's table because it is not our table, it's his. But something does need to be true about you. And it's what John just said. If you've come to the place where you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you know that he is your only hope for forgiveness of sin and life forever. If that's true of you, then you're welcome at his table. As a matter of fact, last week if you were here, John said so to us, I'm not asking you to take a blind leap of faith. Do you remember this? He said, just take a little step and see what comes back to you. I know there are some of you here who have been taking little steps. And perhaps you're at the place where you're ready to take that final step. To say, I believe. To say like Thomas, my Lord and my God. And I want you to know that if that's you, then perhaps the best way for you to do that is by taking communion. By taking bread and cup. By acknowledging he is your Lord. He is your God. He is your Savior. For the first time, perhaps, this morning. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Bible tells us that he was eating the Last Supper, the Passover meal, with his disciples. And as the, middle of, as the meal went on, he took bread and broke it and passed it to them. I want you to pull off that bottom layer and take the bread in your hands. And he said to them, this is my body. It's given for you. Eat this in remembrance of him. The Bible tells us that after they had eaten together, Jesus poured out a cup and he said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and remember him. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for giving to us what we do not deserve and what we could never earn for ourselves. The forgiveness of sin and life in your name. Amen. First, I, I wanted to say uh, praise to God and thank you to Dr. John Dixon for the last two weeks for blessing us with those messages. Thank you. And second, if you're here and you took that step, or you're ready to, we have people in the prayer team that would love to meet with you and pray with you and pray for you. So come let us know if you have or are ready to take that step and say, I believe. I want to have life in his name. And last, if you're new and want to get to know us, meet us at the meet and greet as we close. Now, brothers and sisters, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.